Hello, you guys. Welcome to my channel. Jesus wants you. I'm Nikki Pratt. I am so excited to have you join me here today. Um, it's Saturday, um, uh, the 23rd of January, 2016. Welcome to all my new and current subscribers. All right. Are you guys ready to get into it? I am. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little late. I've been doing some traveling, had a little... Some issues come up with my little girl, so home comes first. You guys know how it is that have children. Yeah. So get your Bibles. You know you cannot come to this channel without your Bible. Um, I will be coming from the King James Version. Um, I think I will be well. I will be clear of understanding. Um, pray about everything I tell you, teach you, preach to you. Um, and just do know that everything that I tell you, I tell myself. All right. Amen. All right. So, beware of wolves in sheep's clothing. This is part three. Part three. Um, there may even be a second video of um, a dream that I had. I might do it tomorrow. I, I, I won't. Um, mm, it may be tonight. I may do it tomorrow. But it was... Uh, yeah, anywho. Okay, so turn your Bibles to First Tim First Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 through 18. I will uh, be dealing with the scriptures, um, chapter 5, verse 17 through hmm, 22, 22, okay? So you'll know. So write it down. Bring pen and paper also with your Bibles. Just in case you want to take notes or write them down, all right? All right. So, um, verse, first chapter, Timothy 5, 17 through 18. 17 reads, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Hmm. So what is Paul saying? Paul here is clearly referring to those whom he called bishops, the elders, bishops, okay? Bishop means overseer, those in oversight. Elder refers to a man, maturity, and experience. Elder is to be aware of what is happening in a congregation and be concerned about it. Now, let's look at this word rule. I'm going to read that verse again, verse 17. It says, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Okay. Now, it said, let's, okay. So, yeah, let's look at that word, rule. Rule. Let the elders who rule well. Most people think that that word rule implies or means boss or lord or governor over your life. Now, write this down. Write this down, what I'm about to tell you. The only one who needs to be lord over your life is the one and only lord. The oh, I must say it again. The only one that needs to be Lord over your life is the one and only L O R D Lord Jesus the Christ. Okay? The word rule means lead. Okay? A common word for leadership, not control. Lead. Okay? Because most people think um, and there are some leaders that abuse the authority of this scripture alone, and they abuse their spiritual authority as far as control. Now, you guys know if you watch part one and two, this mentor I was under abused his authority. It was all of control. 
We don't control. We lead. Rulers lead. Okay? Now, remember that, that old saying that you can lead a horse to the water, but you can't make him drink? Yeah. Same here. You can lead the horse to the water, but you can't make him drink. So, why is that? Because the first gift that God gave man was dominion. Dominion meaning power. The power to make a choice. The power to choose. So if you have the power to choose, how can you be made to do something? A choice to be better or worse, because that comes with making the right or the wrong decision. So a choice to be better or worse, the, or a choice for the wrong or the right way, ultimately, though, it's your choice. We pray by the help of the Holy Spirit, we make the right choices every day. How many of you can attest to what I'm about to say? We don't all make the right decisions all the time. But how can we come about of making those right decisions? I will come to that here quickly. So we pray by the help. <coughs> Sorry, see, there it is. I need water already. <coughs> Hold on just a second. Um, pause the video. Okay. Sorry about that. So we, ho we hope by the we pray and we um count on the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us into the right direction uh, by the cho uh, for the choices that we make. How do we make the best choice? Scripture says we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All things will be added unto us. Here's some more scriptures. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not on thine own understanding, in all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he will, what? Direct thy path. All right. Let's turn over to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah the prophet, chapter 29, verse 11. Sorry, guys. So sorry. She's going to get it together one day. Verse 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, said the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. All right? The book of James, chapter uh, 1, verse 5. So if I'm going a little too fast, pause the video, okay? Uh, James chapter 1 verse 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that give it to all men liberally, liberally, and abrade it not, and it shall be given him. Isn't me sometimes, you know what, I'm, I'm trying to um, become a better person and um, some of you may have struggled with this, but do, when you when you pray, do you and you're seeking for a direction? I mean, what I'm getting at is I'm learning to seek direction on the smallest things because the Lord says we cast all our burdens, cares and burdens, upon Him. Um, so. That's a good practice. Keep that in mind. Uh, the smallest things. What did I say? The book of James. Sorry. The book of James, chapter 1. I lost it. I, didn't, I read that already. I'm sorry. The book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs, chapter 11, uh, verse 14. Okay. That sounded a little rhetoric. Uh, yeah. 
So Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14. Well, as long as I'm taking this, giving you time to find it or catch up. All right? What is, see, I need to go back to my old Bible that was falling out because these pages stick together and they drive me nuts. Okay, verse 14 says, Where no counsel is, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors there is safety. <clears throat> so don't be afraid to seek counsel. Don't think you know everything. Go to the elders of the church, call them somebody you know, ministers, somebody. Get some help, all right? So to control or the controlling spirit is a form of witchcraft all day long and twice on Sunday. It's a form of witchcraft, the controlling spirit. So let's go back to... Um, First Timothy, turn your Bibles back there. <clears throat> First Timothy chapter 5. Let's look at verse 18. It says, um, For the scripture said, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. The laborer is wor worthy of his reward. So if someone... And there are other scriptures say that a man is worth his wages. Same thing, okay? So if someone is feeding you, imparting in you, you have benefited from it spiritually, uh, you've had healing in your mind, deliverance uh, behind a uh, word or by someone's ministry, your eyes have been opened, uh, some imparted wisdom or knowledge, that has uh, helped you uh, become a better you, um, has aided to your repentance, has restored you to salvation, has brought you to Christ, um, you can sow into that person unless they are not bearing fruit and not helping you. You do not want to sow into a ground or into someone or their ministry, particularly if they're not also bearing fruit. Um, you pray God will lead you and lead you to um, do the right thing, okay, especially when it comes to sowing into somebody's ministry. Now, I had a uh, subscriber to ask me, um, I think it was during the summer, and uh, they reached out to me and they emailed me and they asked me about should they continue to sow in this particular person's ministry. And I said, um, well, first, you know, did you pray about it? Pray about it. And uh, Basically, I asked her questions regarding the person's fruit, but this particular person I knew, and um, the person was rude, angry, wasn't bearing any fruit at all, wouldn't even return a phone call. When she reached out to her, wouldn't email her back. Uh, and that was, yeah. So you get my drift. So you don't want to sow into anything like that. Um, so when I, I told that person that they said that they, um, they, I basically confirmed everything that they thought about, and um, they no longer sow to that person's ministry. I say all that to say that to say. Um, this. Um, if you are a subscriber of mine um, and you don't have a place to sow a church home or ministry and you want to honor God with your tithing because that's what the word says 
then you can sow into my ministry. And um, I say that to say this, I've had people, now at some point, real soon, I am going to get a, a P.O. box. I had some people to um, reach out to me. They want to send me T-shirts, uh, books, uh, little gifts, and I didn't have a P.O. box. And um, I had those few people that I trust to send it to my address. But I need a P.O. box. Now, listen to me very well. If I encourage you that if you're not tithing to do so in your church homes or somewhere, again, if somebody is important wisdom and knowledge in you and they're helping you, they're benefiting you, pay your tithes. So into them, if you just want to be a blessing and bless them with something the Lord leads you to do so, do that. God is not trying to get something from you. He's trying to get something to you. Ten cents of every dollar. We pay a tenth of our income or whatever you bring in. Ten cents on a dollar of every dollar. It's the law of reciprocation. You reap what you sow. He will open up the storehouse of heaven, the Bible says, and he will pour out blessings and return it back to you. So, that, again, if you don't have a church or ministry, hold up, hold up. Let me say this. Do not go out and lie on me and say, Lord, Nikki is asking for our money. She wants my money. Let me tell you something. Let me, let me, let me, let me tell you. No. Nikki don't want your money. Not like that. I'm saying that if you don't have somewhere to sow into, because see, we're all going to face judgment as a boy. And if you ever ask, why didn't you sow? I don't want to be blamed for not offer, offering you that opportunity. It ain't for me. So you can honor the Lord with thine increase, with your tithes, your increase, whatever it is, your offerings, whatever you, it is that you want to do. I'm not asking for your money, but if you don't have a place to send your tithes, honor, to, honor your, to honor God with what his word says, you can send it to my ministry. I will keep a record, give you an end of the year uh, printout statement of what, how much, what you sold to, what was it, offering tithes or whatever, for tax purposes. Please don't go and tell somebody that I'm asking for money. Why? Because um, I want you to have that opportunity to do so. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. And if you have that root of all evil, it will add sorrow to it. So, again, you don't want to send your money? Do not send your money. I'm basically just offering you that opportunity so you would have someone somewhere to send the money. Because I don't need that planted seed of sorrow uh, we're supposed to be cheerful giver, givers, so cheerful givers, mouthful. So um, you reap what you sow. Don't look. Don't be um, hasty with your with your giving. Just give from the heart. Give because you know that's what God's command says. Give because you um, know that you're doing the right thing by honoring God or the Lord with your tithes and your offering. I wasn't even planning to even be talking about that, but I was led to do so. And uh, so, anywho, there it is. There is no manipulation here to try to get anybody to do Anything that you don't want to do. Because sometimes people make excuses for what they don't want to do anyway. Okay? All right. So there it is. It's out of the way. All right. Now, um, let's look at something. Huh. 
how are you guys, while I'm pulling this up, how are you guys doing with your prayer life? I'm trying to increase my prayer time. Definitely, definitely do so. Um, it gets kind of hard. Sometimes you don't want to say out loud, which you shouldn't do anyway, that, oh, I'm I'm going to I'm going to go pray. I'm going to go in my closet and I'm going to pray. Don't say that out loud. Don't tell people. Because when you say it out loud, Satan hears it. The phone rings. Your child needs something. Something comes up. Some type of distraction. Set you some time throughout the day. I talked to someone earlier and they said they pray five times a day. It was very detailed. It was very inspiring. They pray um, one particular time of the day for themselves, one for the people, one for the uh, for salvation of the people, one for healing and deliverance. I mean, it was all, hey, sounds good to me. You definitely want to increase. We need to be prayerful um, in this day and time and hour, especially with what's, what's going on. And uh, prayer can only Help us. So, let me, what did I have? Okay, so, let's look at um, verse 19. It says, against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses, but before two or three witnesses, them that sin, rebuke before all that others also may Fear. Now, I kind of stepped ahead of myself. I did not want to read verse 20 yet, but there it is. So, in verse 19, Paul gives a cautionary scripture, a caution. Paul begins um, saying, do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. Yeah. So, in my situation, when I had my money stolen, $1,800, for those of you who didn't know, you didn't see part one and part two, I had a mentor that basically stole my money, and um, I went to my leader of the church, and um, another bishop that was an attorney he was made aware of it. So both of them were made aware of it. Um, <clears throat> that's two witnesses. Okay. I explained everything to them. Yes. Mm hmm Yeah. Basically, he stole your money. Okay. So what they do, they went to this particular leader. Um, basically... It was all shot down. Like, you know, all that this particular leader could say was, I was emotional, uh, I was being disrespectful, but he made instances to say that, yeah, I will, you know, I'm going to um, go to this guy and uh, call on this guy and um, I'll let you guys know when such and such and such come and she'll get her money back. Anyway, it was I'll tell more details of the story in the next I'm sorry, in the next video. Um I'm thinking about having uh, my attorney on my next video uh, by conference call. Um, but to give you a more gist of what happened and uh, what to look out for, what to watch out for and coming from an attorney you would know what to do, what not to do and all that, okay, and he's also a bishop, he's also a minister as well, so, um, but anyway, I did that, I had two witnesses, but then, um, he wasn't having it, you know, so, anywho, the caution in this scripture is of high degree, because Pastoral leadership is a profession that depends upon character. If you do not maintain character, you can lose everything except salvation. Okay? 
Next to your life in Christ, your character is your most valuable possession. So let me let me give you a, a prime example. And I may have used this example in the last video. I don't I don't know. I didn't I didn't watch that one, so I don't know. But let's say um I don't wanna say anybody's name to somebody may Let's say a well-known prophet came to me, and um, let me sh let me show you the difference between um, a man that is has good character, humble, and uh, to the point that well where he would ask for forgiveness and try to restore you or me in my situation that I had to try to try to restore me with my money or something. For instance, let's say um this prophet Joel um uh, came to me and I had stolen my money. And I went to him and he was confronted with it by the two people, and he said, well, you know what? I didn't really mean it to happen that way. I'm sorry. Um, please forgive me. Um, I don't have all of the $1,800 now, but I'm willing to pay you $500 a week until it's paid, $200 a week even, until it's paid. Versus... Uh, I'm not giving you nothing because you're being disrespectful. I don't owe you anything. See, that's ill willed. That's 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 not a man of integrity. That's that's not a. Mm -mm. It's it's just not right. But you see the difference between the two leaders. One that says you're being disrespectful when you know full well you have the money. And then verses one say, well, okay, yes, it happened. Um, I don't have it right now. I'm willing to repay you back. That's a, that's a big difference between the two leaders. But watch this. Watch this. What do you do? Um, because church leaders are highly visible and are tragically vulnerable to adverse re, um, action. So... After the caution, here's courage, because we must be cautious in accusing someone. If the charge is substantiated, we must have the courage to rebuke. Yeah, uh-huh. Those who sin are to be rebuked publicly. Nikki, where is that in Scripture? Verse 20. Uh, First Timothy chapter five says, "Them that sin rebuke before all that others may fear. Rebuke before all that others may fear, because the, the things could happen." Let me not jump ahead of myself. So um, it may sound cold and unloving. But for the church sake, for the sake of the church, others, you do that so others may take warning. They would go like, well, I, I'm not going to do that because if that happens, then this is the consequence that this could happen. So it's an open rebuke for the congregation and that particular leader. You don't want to uphold a leader in his or her sin. Uh, you know, this is the problem. This is where church is today. Churches has lost its nerve. Okay, leaders sin with impunity and then move on to other churches to turn around and do the same thing. Because I found out some things about this particular leader and um, 
there were there was information that was when after I found it out, there was information that came out on Facebook from another church that this particular leader had did the exact same thing. He had stolen money from this minister. Did the exact same thing. See, that's what happened when you you old leaders already get a bad rap. And remember earlier in the video, I spoke about uh, paying tithes, and a, a lot of people have been hurt by the church. The first thing they say is, is I don't need to give a preacher money. And um, all preachers want is your money. You know you said it. You know you heard people say it. Well, in this type of instance, you know, it, I think I did a video before that was called Hurt by the Church or, or something to that nature. But that is why. That is why. Foolishness like this that would happen in a church that would make one leery, like, you know, um, for instance, I went to my doctor uh, recently, and um, the doc not my doctor, as a baby, the doctor that I work for, and um, he donated five hundred dollars to this worthy cause um, for um, someone, one of my friends, and. Um, he said, this is what he said, because he knew of the situation. Um, he was, the doctor I worked for was the one that gave me the $1,800 that I needed for this particular thing, a situation that I needed in my life at that time. Like I said, I'll tell you about it in the future, um, next video. But he gave me the $1,800. But when he gave me this $500 recently, he wrote out the check, he was like, this better not be no preacher scam. Wow. Wow. See what I'm saying? It makes people leery of wanting to trust in a situation that could be truly innocent. But just like the doctor I work for, it made him leery to even want to sow and be blessed um, and or to be a blessing to, to someone else. So we must have the nerve to rebuke a leader or a person or someone after you done went to them first with your two or three witnesses and try to make the situation, you know, the, let me say this. This is where most people in churches and most leaders in the church harbor the sin, you know, oh, well, we don't want to, shh, don't say nothing, oh, because touch not my anointed, don't say nothing. And then they harbor it and keep it quiet. Instead of rebuking after going to them first and if they don't want to do what's right when there's an obvious uh, what's the word I want to use? Um, an obvious wrong then you're going to have to do an open rebuke. You're going to have to have that, that nerve. Um, there's choices to make, but when we make wrong choices, wrong choices have consequences. We must determine not to fall to such a loss of courage, but rather lovingly, at first with two or three witnesses, confront them uh, about their wrongdoing. you got to do it. Um, and then in verse 21, Paul says this, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Nothing. That's coming from the word. That didn't come from me. Nothing by partiality. Well, what is that saying, Nikki? Uh, don't do anything out of favoritism. Don't, don't, uh, well, not doing anything out of favoritism when you know, well, that's my buddy, um, that's, that's my sister in Christ, I know her. Uh, when you know it's an obvious wrong that has affected another member of your church, 
or something, you need to handle that. There should be no partiality. I don't care because it's your, you know them or how long you've been friends with them. If they're wrong, they're wrong. I don't care how long you've known them. If they wrong and they've been found wrong and they don't want to make it right, it's time for an open rebuke. So we can't be partial and show favoritism. Uh, Paul's force of passion here must be because there had been scandalous exercise of favoritism. And he was letting them know. Uh, we, we, can't, we can't do that. Um, but, you know, it's unfortunate today that uh, many denominations go overboard in protecting their elders and their pastors. Some will not even accept the accusation. You know, uh, no, that didn't happen. They won't even try to check it out. And uh, why? Because they choose to overlook a situation sometimes, uh, especially if that leader is bringing in money. Oh, that's going to be a big, great loss. We, we're not going to say anything about that. No. And then what happens? That same ill will person go right down the road, the next church, because maybe you decide not to do nothing. You say, well, you know what? Uh, I'm not going to do anything. And then they don't, they don't go to your church anymore because you kept it hush-hush. They left and they go down the road and do the next thing. Well, it don't need to be a slap on the hand. It needs to be a consequence for that wrongdoing that was made. That has to be done. Um, it, it has to. Uh, for for instance, when um, I made um, an individual aware of what had happened, this person introduced me to this man. Okay. And I told them about the situation. They were upset and um, said that they would talk to him. But then later it turned into when um, my leader posted up something on Facebook saying what he had did, the focus went on what to what she had did of her making the post about him, saying, oh, that's wrong. You're not supposed to do that. You shouldn't do that. Well, nobody wants to do that to a leader because leaders already get bad rep. But the truth is the truth. And to me, if a leader don't want that to happen, then he will humble himself readily and try to respond restore the situation back to back to righteousness. If if that particular person wasn't so prideful about it and not make it right, then that's what he would do. But the focus turned from you know, uh, I'm so sorry he stole your money to the focus went to uh, the other leader that posted up what was actually true. Okay, but what about the money that was stolen from me? What about that? Then it became that I felt like I was, uh, it was it, it was coming over like, you know, I was the one wrong. No, that's not right. I'm the victim. Can we focus and restore me first? And then we can look at other things. But that was posted up on Facebook was act I don't do Facebook by the way, but that what was posted up on Facebook was actually it was true. That per that leader went ahead and took it down. Um but wrong is wrong and right is right. That's that's the way I see it. It's it's coming from the word. It said, Them that sin rebuke before all, that comes right after it said against the elder, receive not an accusation. Meaning, get your two, two witnesses. I had my two witnesses. My attorney, both leaders, an apostle, and one was a bishop, both leaders confronted him. They didn't want to make it right. So what do you do? That's what you do. The next scripture says, them that sin, rebuke before all, 
that others also may fear. Then it comes down in the next verse and says, I charge you before God. Because, see, this is what you don't, um, you want to, you don't want to share in another person's sin to be an accessory, whether it be a new elder or one who was calling the sin. You want you don't want to uphold someone in their wrongdoings, and uh, you speak to them and you try to encourage them to do the right thing, because if you don't, you are condoning them in their sin. You're just as guilty as they are. Uh, there there are leaders that uh, go to another church. That, the, the one that has done the offense will go to another church like he did and do the exact same thing. But I found out in doing research that he had a history of doing it. There you go. Why? Because it was always a slap on the hand and nobody rebuked him openly like scripture says, so it won't be done again. If shh, you're not supposed to do that. No, we don't want to do that. You don't want to bring another leader before the Gentiles and bring it before the world when the world already saying what? All ministers want your is your money. But when it happens, it's just like what happens to a, a rapist when you keep it quiet? And and let's let uh hmm. Let's say a. a a pop star, an entertainer, and, and he's a racist and you keep it quiet, but because he's a a pop star and he is who he is, showing partiality, you keep it quiet. And then he go down the road next month or two and rape somebody else. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. There's been no reprimand or no consequence to restore that person back to repentance than to righteousness. We have to do it. We have to have that. There was caution given, and then there was courage. You have in the scripture. You have to have that courage to do what's right. That's just it. I had somebody. Uh, oh my God! This video is way too many long. Didn't know that. But I had um, someone, a coworker, tell me that she went to this church and. Um, she immediately stopped going because she learned, and there were other people saying, that this minister, 60-some-year-old man, this minister was having affairs with four young girls that sat on the front row all the time while his wife sat on the other side and said it's been going on for a while. Why? Because slap on and you sit there and you know it and you do nothing. You're a leader, you're a deacon in the church, and you do nothing. Let me tell you, when we go before the judgment throne, you're going to have to give and count of that. Yep. You're going to have to give and count of that. You cannot condone somebody. You cannot sit there and know that this kind of stuff is going on and not sit them down. Hey, this is what's going on. These sisters are saying it's going on. This is what happened. See what happens. He may repent, ask for forgiveness, and, you know, but you can't just sit there and, and know it's there. And, and, and if you're a member and you're not a part of the board or the deacon board and all that where you can actually do something, if you to make people known and it's still going on, exit. Do your exodus and walk out that door. Find you another church home because you don't want to be, you, you don't want to be in that. No. Anyway, I'm going to end this video. It's been 44 minutes long. Um, look out for part four. This video is part three. Again, I may have my attorney, bishop attorney, he wears two hats, um, on this call, so uh, on the next video.
love you guys. see you next time. thanks.